Uh, my name is Sharon Kalwani, and uh, um, I'm actually a, a, a long-time member of the Michigan Unix Users Group. Mug, uh, some of you might remember, as one of the original co-founders back in 1986. Uh, at that time, it was just uh, semi slug and ourselves who did in Unix, and you know, dabbled with source code and did all sorts of stuff, uh, kernel, device driver writing. Um, Pingo and Khan, so that's where my background is from Unix. And of course, uh, to me, Linux is an open source. Just flowed out of that. I remember sharing everything we could about resources, technology, knowledge. We freely gave. We just enjoyed it. Uh, to me, uh, uh, nothing gives me more satisfaction than sharing and seeing something succeed or making a difference in human lives. And to me, high performance computing is one such uh, application where we actually can make a difference in human life. And I'll try a few examples, and uh, I hope I have enough time. And uh, the other thing is, feel free to ask me any question, any time. I don't mind uh, taking with the flow, and uh, with that, let's uh, get started. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, some new subjects, and Linux, and Big Data as well. Um, and of course, uh, big data today, uh, as I was telling my uh, friends over at the Michigan User Group, you can't swing the dead cat without hitting the word phrase big data somewhere. So I'll talk a little bit about it. But it's been high performance computing and Linux which made that possible. It wasn't there before. Uh, would you like me to move in the front uh, if that's okay? All right, then. That way you don't, uh, you, you can't say that I. I gave you a pain in the neck, and if somebody would just hit the next key, that will work. Then we can advance the slides. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about this. We used to call it supercomputing. These days, it's called high-performance computing. To us, supercomputer, we had a lot of funny definitions for it. Uh, it's stuff that at least costs a million dollars. It's faster than anything you can buy uh, today. That's supercomputing. Um, but uh, we later uh, uh, realized that it's not just compute anymore, it's also moving lots of data real fast. It's about seeing those graphic pixels at blinding speeds. And so uh, I, I like to use like in electrical engineering, Fleming's uh, you know, uh, three finger rule. It's not just compute, it's also large memory, and it's also large movement of data, large IO. And that's, uh, that is uh, high performance computing because it's in all three things. And pretty soon they'll become passe and uh, I'll talk a little bit about what is next here. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, it's always been the case that once you figure out you do something, then you say, what can I do to accelerate or move it faster? And uh, this is where, um, you know, some of the early uh, applications or usage or demand for high performance computing actually came from two places. Los Alamos is well known for folks who worked in the nuclear, you know, bomb industry and uh, they said we need to do uh, all these calculations and uh, they inspired this chap, Seymour Craig. He was the guy who actually founded this entire industry. He was a master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Minnesota. And uh, he liked to tinker and do stuff. And uh, I was very fortunate that I met him on my very next day at the job. And we talked at great length uh, about all sorts of things, hardware, software. Very few people know that he actually spent six months in software and he pretty quickly got up and said, it's far more tough than hardware. So he, he wrote a Fortran runtime library. And, of course, that is still there, hidden somewhere in Cray's uh, Fortran uh, uh, compiler <coughs> archives. So they were really domain specific. The second one is the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is located in Boulder, Colorado. They got the very second machine that uh, he actually built, and that's what that machine looks like. I'll say a little bit about it in a second. Um, Today we get our weather on little Excuse apps me? and smartphones. We listen to the weather, you know, on five o'clock news. Uh, Can you move to another chair? Or on 
kind of video. Eight every hour on Thank you. Radio. Sorry. <laughs> but it was these folks who actually wrote the first set of programs that could take input temperature readings, wind readings, all that sort of stuff in the early 70s. Prior to that, weather prediction was just a uh, art, you know. Uh, they, they have historical records and experience, but they figured out that what we can do is actually model all of these, and we need to calculate it fast so that we can say, this is what the weather is going to be like. And they inspired then a whole uh, industry or class of generation that used high-performance computing. And so that was the whole thing that they needed uh, uh, high-speed calculations. PDEs are partial differential equations and matrices that they needed to invert. That was critical there. And so around 1972, he got a contract for the Los Alamos. And then in 1975, he delivered two machines. One to them, it was without an OS, with, uh, without software. They wrote their own software and a loader, bootstrap. Um, pretty close to assembly language. It was actually called CAL, Cray Assembly Language. And uh, that's what the machine looked like. It has a very interesting curvature because he calculated uh, the speeds at which logic would communicate with each other. And he put wires of a specific length because he didn't want anything to take more than one nanosecond to cross that wire. And so that everything was very carefully calibrated he also made sure that the wires were twisted so that the field effect, whenever you send current through a wire, there's a little flux around it. So by twisting it, you can cancel that out and you could shorten the length of the wire and that would save. The, and that was the first model of Cray-1 out there. Next slide. Um, what were the characteristics? Well, in those days, 1975 was perhaps <coughs> the first time most of us had uh, probably seen the hobby kits MSI 8080, the 8-bit microprocessor. This was 64-bit word length. That means it fetched 64 bits in one shot. It wrote out 64 bits in one shot. Everything, the register, the arithmetic logic unit, everything was in 64 bits. That was the smallest unit of anything it would do. And it did that because it needed a lot of data that it wanted to move and do precision calculations. Just for reference, it had a 12.5 nanosecond clock speed. If you want to translate to today's, that's about 80 megahertz. You might, uh, sorry? At that time, mainframes were doing 32 bit words going, right? Yes, yes. Okay. But mainframes didn't do scientific computing the way we wanted to. A lot of folks would use uh, uh, smaller computers, controllers, and things like that. But even the mainframes, they were uh, largely 16-bit. Remember, this was also the time when many computers, digital equipment, data general, uh, all of those came onto the scene. Well, I was talking about IBM. Yeah, IBM, IBM Amdahl, and uh, their ilk, they had 32-bit, uh, but they were extremely limited. They didn't do uh, scientific computing. As a matter of fact, IBM came out with an add-on product called VF, Vector Attached Facility, that they, they would do, and so they'd send off a little calculation, do the thing, and come back, kind of like what we know today as GPGPUs, or your NVIDIA, or CI that are cards, and that's what they do, when you have a calculation stream, and then it's a whole scene, maybe a full frame of uh, your laptop, 3000 by 1920 pixels, it would send that whole thing across in one fell swoop, do the calculation on every pixel, send it back, and then you'd see that display refresh. So those were the kind of things. But this, at that time, was very revolutionary. And the interesting thing is he used off-the-shelf components, stuff you can buy from a catalog at MCM Electronics, yeah. uh, to put the whole thing together. You had a huge thing that you pick out and construct the chip plan, and there were modules, and then he arranged them vertically in that picture I showed, and then wire wrap all of them together. Yes. So in that case, there was already a, a material and sourcing network in place. Nothing had to be developed except these are the instructions to build it. Yes, uh, uh, he, he, he didn't have to do anything uh, interesting or special. He used all the components out there. And uh, that, that was his genius. And uh, really, you know, uh, people were quite surprised. They thought it would have to be very special, but he proved otherwise. And he realized a lot of things that today we take for granted or people did enormous amount of research. 
I refer to this as the original RISC, reduced instruction set computers. He realized that, you know, if you uh, look at your IBMs uh, or your data generals or mini computers, you have instruction and then you have your data. You can have 8-bit instruction, 16-bit instruction, or 24, but there are varying lengths. Every time you fetch instruction, you got to decode it. When you decode it, you find out what's the addressing. Is it direct addressing, indirect? Is there a offset in it? And that wasted a whole lot of time. In reduced instruction set computers, everything's the same size. You take one clock cycle to fetch the instruction, one clock cycle to write out, uh, do the execution, one clock cycle to write it back or load and store. Everything happened in one clock cycle. And so that was the inspiration for a lot of other people who came out with the RISC chips. And then we know them as your uh, SPAR chips, their RISC chips, or the HP PA RISC, that's RIPS, or the MIPS, all of these. Uh, most of your printers, network printers, or controllers, they all use RISC chips. Uh, MIPS sells about 20 million microprocessors that are there. We just don't realize it. All those uh, uh, microprocessors in your smartphones and tablets, they're actually internally risk chip. We've all heard of ARM, ARM. You know what that originally stood for? A risk machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's a fact. And it was built by a company or used uh, Acorn computers. They were, had a lot to do with the original lineage of that. And so he realized all of these things, and uh, a lot of people said, yes, that's, uh, and he did that in the 70s. The first RISC design didn't come out until like late 86 or 87, so almost by 10 years. He was way ahead of his time. He, he also realized a lot of other things that if you want to speed things up, let's in, introduce a vector instruction set. You want to multiply something? Well, why just do it at one thing? Why don't I give you a whole array? Let's say, start at this, it's a table. Every column or every row multiplied by the same thing, add the same thing, divided by whatever. So that's what an, a vector instruction is. So that was the true multiplier effect. Again, happens in one instruction, one clock cycle. That was the beauty. People thought you have to decode these instructions, make it fancy. And really, the whole beauty was make it very simple. And then the most important thing, that we face today in our effort to build bigger and more powerful machines is the memory processor balance. Very quickly they realized if you want to have a fast processor crunch on these numbers, well, what's uh, uh, going to be the biggest uh, bottleneck is not the clock speed cranking on those things, but feeding it with data from the memory. So the memory to processor pipeline or bandwidth or uh, you know traffic that has to be in balance. If you have too fast of a processor, you're going to stall out, and that's wasteful. Pretty soon, about maybe three, four years later, every machine that followed the Cray 1 XMP was extended with multiprocessing. Why be this had four processors or four cores, if you like? This had eight cores, and they just called it Y because they weren't terribly created, you know, X Y. <laughs> The Cray 2 had 16 processors, Cray 3 had 64 processors, and this is all by the late 80s. And again, you know, we didn't see multi-core until maybe 10, 15 years later, so that's what they did. But they realized a couple of years later that after the Cray 1, every machine, if you actually ran the bill of materials and said, okay, how much does this cost? 90% of the cost was in the memory. They had to construct a memory that you could fetch any data from anywhere without the processor suddenly starved and says, where's the next piece of data? I'm going to idle or going to uh, idle or wait state or twiddle my thumbs. And so 90% of that $1 million was spent making a special memory uh, uh, construction. And they took the memory and put it into banks where they could easily resolve Again, with that, that same one clock instruction cycle, if it says, I want address so-and-so, immediately it would figure out by the time the next clock instruction is issued that it says it's right here, it's routing everything, and we would pick it all up. So that was, the, and today we're facing that problem. If you Google for memory wall, you'll actually discover that 
We can build microprocessor systems with hundreds and thousands of them. But the memory is the bigger bottleneck. And so we have to come up with all sorts of ways. Uh, and that's why we have clusters today where we give each of the processors their own little memory and chop it up in little bits. Try to tell the programmer, can you chop up your program in little bits, distribute it out there, you calculate it, put it together, because we can't make the memory talk fast enough to the processor. That's a key thing. Next slide, please. Okay, well, um, high performance computing, this is the part that I love sharing with a lot of folks who, you know, uh, it's just history. Um, uh, there are a number of technologies that were pioneered because there was like these folks that you read about in sci-fi stories, there was a never-ending quest, how can you get more performance? What can we do? Uh, I remember uh, sitting in a room, talking to a lot of people, what should we do? A, it almost felt like a, an obsession or a passion with them. Uh, let's get down to the bit level, see what we can do out there, whether it's a physical technology or software or firmware, just to make it much more faster. One of, I, I talked about the risk inspiration already, but today's solid state disk, you know, you put your USB in there and it says, oh, can I use that? Or for maybe a couple hundred bucks, you can buy an SSD little uh, thing, put in your laptop, suddenly makes it faster. Well, SSDs were invented way back in the middle 70s by high performance computing folks. Because, again, the same problem, what happens with memory when you're creating results and you want to write it out to disk? Well, the disks were very slow. There were these giant copper colored platters you might even see nowadays maybe in a junkyard or somewhere and they move around and uh, they were very slow, they were very costly and it caused the processor to wait. So they said, what can we do to make it faster if money is no object? Well, they said, let's, uh, well, what is a disk after all? It's nothing but magnetic uh, media and we're writing bits and it's got maybe a radial characteristic and some arm that's moving. But if you really think about it, it's nothing but a whole string of bits that if you took and stretched out, is the same as what's on a platter, a rotating platter. You know, take all the bits on the top platter, the bottom platter, you can string them all together. Well, that's memory. And so, uh, I remember working on the device driver for solid state disk and everything that you do, you know, read a file, write a file, seek to a sector, seek to a track, position ahead. We took all those commands and translated them into a slash prop driver and uh, practically now everyone out there, they use elements of that code out there because it's very simple. It's only about <coughs> 130 lines in. <clears throat> and that was the beauty of Unix because it allowed you, uh, this was George Kennedy back in the AT&T labs who first proposed why can't we treat files uh, or memory, all of them as simple devices. Once that realization hit, that's what made Unix and Linux very elegant and you could build it like uh, toolboxes, add, subtract things and it was a complete departure from historical design of operating systems which oriented everything about, about a physical hardware and Unix and Linux, their inspiration is that we don't care what the hardware is, let's have a little layer in between that knows about the hardware. Everything on top looks like a plain vanilla OS to us and that was the beauty. And then massive uh, memory, I'll come back to multi-core in a second, but today high performance computing, the kind of systems that I work on, uh, we usually try to have one big contiguous piece of memory and surrounded with processors. Usually we start at one terabyte and above. Yeah. That's the kind of massive memory. And we're not going to stop there. We're going to try to go even bigger, even higher, because uh, we need uh, all that data to operate on it. But they're also uh, inspiration for multi-core uh, software. We know them as MPI libraries. And then, of course, if earlier, and because of solid state, this they even said, let's decouple the compute from I/O, so it'll make it better. Another thing that they came up with was high-speed parallel interface. At that time, this was 400, and then six months later, 800 megabits a second. This actually led to uh, the possibility of 
having a device driver so that you could hook up a big giant wall of whatever LCD display or monitor display and run it from a computer at the back and get real-time information. Of course, the folks who paid for all this initial work were largely you know, people at the Department of Energy and Department of Defense so that they could do a lot of simulation technology and watch all of this. And then, of course, there were things that happened in the hardware, all that basket of little components that he was using, that was all ECL, pretty quickly changed to CMOS. And then once densities grew, then you know you couldn't do that anymore. Then you'd have to do spend several years in chip design simulation, fabricate the chip, and then have everything in there go. ECL uh, is no longer used. Uh, ECL was emitter coupled logic, and then CMOS was uh, metal on uh, substrate uh, technology. It's just more density. And then the last one, which came from multi-core, was MPR message, message passing interface. I'll say a little bit more about that later. We have the next slide. Okay. Oh yes. Uh, and then uh, around the middle of the 80s, this is where huge upheavals took place. Um, I actually uh, remember spending a couple of years where we couldn't decide whether we could go with silicon or use the special semiconductor uh, material called gallium arsenide. If you go back in the early 80s, most of your telecom companies, many of them are still around, but like AT&T and others, they used uh, processor boards that the chips were made from gallium arsenide because they're three times faster in switching than regular silicon. The problem with that was they're very difficult to fabricate and they would burn up a lot. But for a few years, they competed with each other. Pretty soon then silicon, once they got more integration, they could put more and more millions of transistors on the chip get down, uh, get the clock speed up, and make sure that the heat wasn't as bad, then this kind of went by the wayside. This was the biggest one uh, that hit us. I talked about vector instructions, where you have one instruction, you can operate on 64 elements, or 128, or whatever, 1,000 elements of data. Well, at that time, we had a huge debate in the industry, and uh, a lot of folks felt that microprocessors would replace vectors, and they were right. And we call it killer micros because at, at that time, apparently there was some science fiction movie. I've never been able to get a copy or see it, if any of you can point me. Attack of Killer Tomatoes? Is that <laughs> no, this is true. It was inspired by that. And there was this guy in um, early or middle 80s who put out a cartoon where he took the movie poster and did some changes and put microprocessors and said, we got a changeover. Well, a, a lot of those folks inspired in the US government at that time. Um, Bill Clinton was the president and he signed a, uh, a, treaty, a treaty that said we're no longer going to do surface testing of nuclear weapons. But we still need to make sure that whatever we have, we can measure all the things about it, radiation or uh, mass and all that sort of stuff and verify that this uh, weapon is going to work or not work. How do we do that? So we said we can simulate that whole thing, but in order to do that, we need to build really powerful computers, and we're going to use lots of microprocessors. And so they had this uh, thing, Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative, or ASCII, and it has nothing to do with the 8-bit uh, representation of you know, zeros and ones and uh, two alphabets. <coughs> that changed direction for everyone throughout the globe. For the first time then, we actually had a project, and they were given names like ASCII Blue, ASCII White, ASCII Red, ASCII um, <coughs> Purple, where each time they said, all right, every two years we build something, we build something with 500 cores, and this is, uh, we're talking 92, then two years later, 94, with 1,000 cores, and it went on, and it finally topped out at about 16,000 cores, then they said, during those times, we tried it, tested it, we found numerous problems. How do you run an operating system which has 16,000 cores? <laughs> you know, we had uh, inspiration for them changing completely the design of the operating system. And around this time, because of microprocessors and the ASCII initiative, Linux first appeared on the scene. Because before that, it was all Unix. Next slide, please. Um, 
a little bit about, you know, again, when you have these powerful machines, you're doing it to, you know, calculate something to solve a problem. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of folks get too focused on, you know, my machine is bigger than yours or my machine is faster than yours. So that uh, created the famous macho flops race. And uh, the flop is floating point operations, and that's the flops per second. And usually it was related to clock speed. So 12.5 uh, nanoseconds, the first gray one, you could do uh, 8 million uh, floating point operations a second. Assuming you've got all the data ready and there's nothing missing and it'll just go straight through and calculate. So you never got that peak, you got something close to it. And around that time, the uh, biggest competitors were USA and Japan. And uh, just to share with you terminology, while well, it was megaflops, we called them macho-flops, then we went to gigaflops, teraflops, and today we actually have petaflops. Uh, five years ago, the first petaflop machine was installed, and it just retired last week. So already in this industry, usually if you put in something, it's there for 10, 20 years. But in five years, it's becoming obsolete. And the industry wants, in the year 2018, to have an exaflop machine, that means something with 1,000 petaflops. My personal view, it's not going to happen. It's going to cost too much. Uh, if we wanted something with one exaflop or a 1,000 petaflops, which is defined as uh, 64 quadrillion multiplications or subtractions, addition, floating point operations per second, if we use today's technology, we'll need a nuclear power reactor with 300 megawatts of energy. <laughs> it would uh, be about the size of maybe 80 football fields put together. So I don't think that's going to happen until there's something revolutionary. We're looking at people in the quantum um, field, uh, quantum computing, and uh, that's a whole different topic altogether. And there are people doing research on that. Uh, Columbia University, they're already trying to build compilers for quantum computers. MIT's got uh, a lab about the room this size where they're using special things. And they're able to oscillate the atoms. And it has four different states. And so those four different states uh, it helps it to do that calculation. Next slide, please. Um, but uh, how do you keep score? Who has a faster or more powerful machine? Well, uh, 93, uh, Jack Dungar, Eric Strohmeyer, Hans Muir, and Bork Simon. Uh, Dungar is at the University of Tennessee. Strohmeyer and Bork uh, Simon are both at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab out on the West Coast, and Hans Muir is in Europe. They decided that uh, there's a linear algebra package called LIMPAC. And most of the time, you are doing calculations, and you'll be using this package one way or another. Let's standardize on that. And that became the top 500 list. It's the 500 machines in the world that will run that package and post a score of how many you know, megaflops or gigaflops were they able to achieve. And then that inspired a lot of things. Uh, the last three years, we have the Greek 500, which says, for this amount of calculation, which has the least energy, electricity, that it would draw in order to do that calculation. And then there's another set of people, the Graph 500, where they do search algorithms which have nothing to do with floating point calculations. And so uh, they want to find an object, so they'll do searching, they'll have a database. And so they have the Graph 500, and they look certainly quite different. And there'll be a couple more uh, lists as these machines get applied in different fields, you'll actually start seeing same basic technology, but architected, put different ways to then deliver a different result. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, could you, there's a little slide up there. If you Google top 500, this is um, the last uh, list uh, that we had. Uh, it actually shows the progression of, this was the most powerful machine back in 93. And then this is the least powerful machine in the top 500 list. And it's been progressing because technology is pro progressing. And you notice a little jump once in a while. And uh, the interesting thing is that in those days, in 93, the most powerful, the number one on the list, if you fast forward, it won't even make the cut today. And uh, there are other versions of this list which use, instead of a linear scale, a logarithmic scale, I've got a table about that, so if you go to the next slide. 
you'll notice some very interesting things. Okay, now part of the talk had limits in it, so I've got to talk about operating systems now. Uh, of course, earlier I said, you know, they came without software. You wrote your own software with assembly. Uh, but, you know, they realized they needed it. So they had the first uh, CTSS, create time sharing system, which actually 